Hey, everybody. With the Consumer Technology Association, I'm Tyler Suters. We are the owners and the producers of CES, the biggest, the most influential tech event on the planet. We are trying to get you CES ready, all right? Getting you all geared up for the big show in Las Vegas this January 8th to 11th. Now, you know CES is this remarkable tech show, right? But did you know CES is also an amazing auto show? Yeah, USA Today called it one of the 10 best auto shows, in fact. You will find the latest vehicle tech innovations, the latest in concept cars, and also connected vehicles that will just blow you away. But today we're taking a specific look at the vehicle tech world, and that is self-driving vehicles, right? These are going to make our roads remarkably safer. Think about when we get deep in this direction, we have self-driving vehicles all over our roads, and we're cutting into those 35,000 plus lives that are taken every year here in the U.S. on our roadways. SDVs are also going to enable greater accessibility, better job opportunities for seniors, for people dealing with disabilities who, who can't drive for themselves. And all of that equals greater productivity for us as a society, as a country. In the end, you'll see Las Vegas is going to look like a turbocharged Detroit when it comes to vehicle tech at CES 2019. So today, we are getting you two separate takes on the promise of self-driving vehicles. One is a journalist. She is deep in the policy world of this sector here in Washington, D.C., and also the tech innovation that's going on in Silicon Valley right now around vehicle technology. And then we're talking to a longtime vehicle innovator. He comes from the global auto hub of Big Detroit and has some valuable insights given his deep past in vehicle innovations. So you may not know Kim Hart by name or by byline, but I bet you've seen her work if you're anywhere around the SDV space. She is right now managing editor at Axios, but she has also worked at the Washington Post, The Hill, and just to get a federal perspective, she was a press secretary for the FCC for two years. And Kim, it's great to have you with us here. Thank you for having me. Nice to have you actually coming into studio from yes. your offices at Axios, which are which are not far away. That's right, very close. Um, so what's the atmosphere right now? And I ask that very broadly to someone who talks to lots and lots of smart people in the self-driving vehicle space. So I think there's a lot of excitement around the potential for self-driving vehicles. I think there is still some skepticism, though, about the timeline, how soon they'll actually be a reality and whether some of the estimates might be overly ambitious or overly optimistic. I think there are still some skeptics on the safety, as which is not surprising. Um, and you, you, that's really what's holding up some of the legislation that I'm sure we can talk and get into. So I think that there's, you know, if you're in Silicon Valley, for example, there's so much much money and so many startups working on different elements of this mm -hmm. technology that there's so much buzz and excitement and like the, the the line there is just look at how much this is going to be able to do this is going to be able to give freedom to people in all walks of life from elderly citizens to children who need to be, uh, you know, shuttled from school to soccer practice. It could help free up parents who need extra hands or who, who need help with running errands or so on. Um, it could help industries. It could help uh, trucking. It could help save energy on the highways if cars are able to autonomously drive closer together and therefore kind of take advantage of the airflow and platoon, if you will. So there's a lot of excitement across the board. But like I said, there's, there's still some question about when is this actually going to be a reality? And you see different estimates. Some say it could be as soon, you know, people, some companies are actively deploying cars right now mm -hmm. in certain areas of the country. But there are, you know, in some area, other areas of the country where they have harsher weather conditions, for example, or really mountainous roads. I mean, it's going to be harder for people to, number one, feel comfortable getting in a car without a driver mm -hmm. or even a driving wheel. And I think it's going to be hard. It'll take longer for companies to feel comfortable rolling out those technologies commercially in those places. So you're going to see a very even rollout and also a very uneven adoption rate. And so I think you, you depending on where you are in the country and um, and also probably what generation you are, it, you, you're really going to see these technologies in a very different light. You know, that's, that's a great point. I want to get back to that in terms of 
uh, the generational acceptance or, or maybe geographical perception. But let's start with geography, Kim, based on leadership right now. So you mentioned Silicon Valley to begin with. Um, right there, as you said, a number of small companies and major tech players are in this space. Um, are they leading on their own or is it critical right now to have that automobile industry partner on board? I think it depends on who you're talking to. So mm -hmm. if you're Waymo, which was started as just a, a, a an experiment within Google yeah. um, and then spun out as its own unit because they saw real commercial potential for for you know creating its own business outside of Google. I think you know they are they're they're using vehicles uh, created by an auto manufacturer, but they're really building everything else from the ground up. So while they are right now um, using a, a, an OEM, minivan in order for and and retrofitting it with their own technology they're really building the technology everything else around it um and so i think they would argue that they're going to kind of be self-sufficient and main, they, they're not going to need detroit um to really get going and get on the road um you have other other companies that are really building more components some are perfecting the lidar or right. the radar or right. the sensors and they're perfecting the different p different components of the technology that then will be pieced together and a lot of the automakers in Detroit Ford and GM they've all got different approaches to how they are building these out some of them are doing it more piecemeal mm -hmm. by taking those the technologies that are being created in, in Silicon Valley and adding them on to their own existing technologies or they're looking at if you look at like you know GM has invested in Cruise, and they're really trying to become its own self-sustained unit. So I think it really depends. But I think one thing that is really clear is Silicon Valley and Detroit, there's a nice, there's a very healthy competition, I think, going on mm -hmm. there in that they know that they kind of need each other, but it's really a race to be the next hotbed for this industry. And Detroit is not used to being second fiddle when it comes to mm -hmm the automotive industry. So they have a real incentive to attract the talent that mm -hmm. that's needed to to develop the stuff uh, there and to take advantage of, you know, some and, and helping to revitalize Detroit, to be honest, because um, they have so much of the infrastructure for testing vehicles, for making vehicles from scratch that uh, if you live in the Bay Area, you know, there's just not a lot of that there. Right, right. So is it fair to say when comparing the two geographic centers, Kim, Silicon Valley is about the art of the possible, to use a well-known catchphrase now. Sure. Is Detroit right now more about the art of the practical, right? The realistic view of how many cars can we make? How quickly can we adapt an entire fleet? How soon can we get them on the road? I think that's actually a really good way of putting it. I mean, they've they've always been rooted in, I mean, the, the auto industry, um, you know, throughout its lifespan has been very focused on numbers. How do we make this work? How do we get certain cars on the road that consumers are going to want to drive? And how do we make that a profitable business that so that we can employ all the workers that rely on us for their livelihood? And I, so I think it, it comes from a very different generational place um, and a place in, in the American economy. Um, when you think about, you know, for, for Silicon Valley, a lot of the projects have been kind of, they started as side projects or they were kind of vanity projects in some ways. And they kind of took on a life of their own because they're like, oh, I think we're onto something here. But it was never a, we're doing this to pay the bills. It was kind of a, let's, let's see what we can do because we are smart people and have a little bit of free time. Yeah, there was a moonshot atmosphere to yep. some degree, right? Exactly. And I think there's still very much that. I mean, we're not – people are already looking way beyond self-driving cars to, you know, flying taxis. So I think that this is just one – step in a, at a broader approach to the future of transportation and how we move generally, however, whether that includes roads or not in the future. And I think Detroit is still pretty focused on, okay, let's perfect this. And how do we get this on the road before we get ahead of ourselves to the next thing? And mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, that, that actually comes into play when you think about the reactions to the the, the bills, the legislation that is that has been trying to work its way through Capitol Hill. Um, you know, there the House passed the Self Drive Act about a year ago, and since then the Senate component, the um, AV Start Act, has been stalled. Right. Um, and people are getting pretty. They're kind of starting to lose hope that they're actually going to get it through this legislative session. Yeah. So that's a great point. At the risk of becoming the king of paraphrasing, uh, you know, Silicon Valley is software, SDV mm -hmm. software. Let's say just generally. Detroit is very much the hardware. Washington's the infrastructure, right? And if right. not just maintaining roads and bridges, et cetera, it's who has rights where, what's allowed, who's responsible. Um, 
who is uh, in trouble when something goes wrong. Right, right, exactly. And I think that the the automakers in Detroit are very used to working with regulators. So they've worked with the Department of Transportation for decades mm-hmm. and the, um, the, the highway safety um, you know, regulators and so on. And so they are really looking to some certainty from Washington and from regulators saying here are th- to put out some national standards that they can then refer to and say, OK, we know some, some certainty that this is what regulators are going to expect from us. They're going to allow us to do, but w- how we need to report back to them, what kind of uh, safety measurements they're going to take, what we need, what they, what kind of information they need from us in order to make this huge investment into getting these cars on the road. Because it is a really big shift in business for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of turns its, the whole you know car ownership model on its head, if you think, if you think about it. But for San Francisco, for Silicon Valley and the Bay Area, they are Aren't as concerned about that legislation being stalled because they see, well, some states, while that's stalled, some other states, 29 other states have come in and passed their own regulations or their own laws that will govern how self-driving cars can be deployed and tested in their jurisdictions. And so they're just kind of plowing ahead and saying, well, while the feds get their acts together, we're going to pick our spots in the states that make sense for us. And we're going to just keep on testing and keep on deploying and see what we can learn. So I think they do know that this is going to be an iterative process because it's not just about the technology and just about the infrastructure. It's also about consumer adoption and consumer um, perception of these vehicles. So that's going to take some time to test. And that's what they're working on in the states in a smaller, on a smaller scale, um, while they wait for the federal um, level to kind of create what they want the national framework to be. Right. And that national framework is critical. And I'm I'm speaking practically here. You are in Pittsburgh, let's Mm -hmm. say, and you're with Uber or you're with Uh, Carnegie Mellon and the AI Center there, but you're testing in Pittsburgh. And that gets back to an area where, as you pointed out, has the the climatological variety, which is a fancy way of saying they have crummy weather, right? Right. Most of the year. Right. And so SDVs can test under those conditions. That's great. So you get an okay from Pittsburgh or a general permit to test and you're okay in the city limits. And then what happens when you're in the county? What's the rule there? Then Mm -hmm. say you're on a a really long testing uh, uh, campaign. What happens when you cross the state line into Ohio, right? And then you multiply that by every state border around the country, and it underscores the need for the federal government to do something and something soon. Right. And the industry knows that in order to have a viable business, they're going to need to sell cars that can drive from coast to coast. That if they need, if, if a car needs to get from California to Maine, it can do that and not have to do either zigzags to avoid states that don't allow them or have different rules. Or maybe, you know, they can get to the, the border of Arizona but can't go any further. Right. Um, and that really, that's, that's no good for anyone. That's no good for the trucking companies or logistics companies that want to use this technology to do to, to move goods and people um, and that's not consumer-based. Mm-hmm. So to quote one of my favorite lines ever from The Simpsons, I believe it was Ned Flanders who said, uh, I'm from a little place between New York and Los Angeles called America. <laughs> All right. And, and when we talk about America, um, that's those of us who will, who will buy these cars and who will eventually buy them in mass, right, and, and, and drive adoption. In theory. Yes, <laughs> exactly, in theory. Or, or share them. Right. To some degree. What are you hearing from the rest of the country, uh, the real people who are paying gas prices and looking for parking and navigating our interstates? Well, so I actually – I have family in Tampa, and mm-hmm. Tampa, Florida is one of the testing grounds for uh, for building out kind of smart roads and smart mm-hmm. highways to test some of these these cars. And they're very excited about it. They think, wow, this is, this is cool. Um, they don't really know what it will look like in five years, but they're not opposed to testing of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you're seeing that in and, – and that's one reason that these companies are picking the places that they are – to test because there, there's a generally open I, public opinion about it. Like there's, the people don't hate them there. They're not mm-hmm. super skeptical. So mm-hmm. And um, the laws, the state laws reflect that, that there may be more, uh, more relaxed rules about what's required, how, how, you, how many miles you have to drive, whether there, how, how many people need to be in the vehicle, whether it's a, kind of an autopilot kind of situation or someone's already, always monitoring the car. And so there are all these, these different levels of rules for and different levels of autonomy for vehicles. Mm-hmm. But I think if you look at the places where you're seeing most 
most of the testing happening. It's it's Texas, it's Florida, um, Arizona is a huge hotbed. And those are places where there's a lot of enthusiasm and they're taking advantage of that. Um, you know, it's hard to, to tell what other jurisdictions feel about it because they're not as used to it. There's not as much happening there. Um, but I think that the car companies are trying to get out ahead of that. Um, and even if there aren't active autonomous vehicles on the road, they're trying to get a sense for how consumers are going to interact with them. So you remember was it was a year ago that uh, there was a news report that there was a van driving around Arlington without a driver. Do you remember this? <laughs> That's Arlington, Virginia, right outside uh, D.C. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and people noticed that there was no driver and kind of freaked out about it. And they're like, what is this? And social media blew up. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it turns out that it was an experiment by um, researchers at Virginia Tech in partnership with Ford to get a sense of how pedestrian and other drivers would react if they saw a car moving without a driver. And it was a, there was a lot of surprise and a lot of double takes. And I think it, and people kind of avoided it and stopped driving around it or, and pedestrians didn't really know what to do. And that was a very good learning experience for the researchers because a big, um, a big part of this is not only how it drives on the road, but how other drivers react with a car that doesn't have what they're used to having in a car. Uh, bringing this back to your wheelhouse, Kim, and that is policy, specifically federal policy. Um, one of the carryover issues that has been seemingly consistent, at least externally, between the Obama administration and the Trump administration is the Department of Transportation's position on self-driving vehicles from Secretary Anthony Fox to the current Secretary Elaine Chao. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that developing further? Do you see inconsistencies? Do you see this as a great way to get self-driving vehicles on the road faster, Congress notwithstanding? That's a good question. I think that there has been a good continuation um, from one administration to the next mm -hmm. on the an acknowledgement that this is coming and we need to keep up with the industry and with the technology and trying to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Congress has to go on its own path and its own dual track. But I think from what I understand, um, the, the the companies and the industry itself has been pretty pleased with the the speed at which regulators in the, in, in the agencies are moving forward. Yes, it always takes longer than industry would like because regulation is is hard and it takes a while, even if it's a fairly simple standard or rule that they're coming up with or revising some guidelines. All of that takes way more time than any company would would like it would take that it would take. But I think that they're fairly pleased that it's it's moving along and at least there are um, people who are enthusiastic about the future and the potential benefits of the technology working within the government. You mind if we end with a short pop quiz? Go for it. It's all just yes, no, and it's really based on your opinion. So okay. you, you can't get any wrong, Kim. But I'm, but I'm curious, given how deep you are in the in the industry, have you ridden in a self-driving vehicle? I have, yes. Okay. Are you excited for them to be on the road? Yeah, yes. Would you buy one if it were ready right now? No. Would you test drive one as a considerable purchase? Yes. Okay. Will we see self-driving vehicles on the road Next year? Probably not. Commercially available? No. No. Okay. All right. Last question. It's not a yes or no. It's not binary. All right. So you can, you can free will a little bit, Kim. When will we see Congress act? You know, not in, in, in 2018. Beyond this, what do you see? I think there will be enough uh, pent-up interest and demand um, and maybe some of the safety advocates who have been some of the holdups this time might become more comfortable and we might start to see some action in 2019. I think you're going to see a really uh, 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 orchestrated push from the industry to figure out what needs to happen to get this over the finish line, whether that's addressing certain concerns, making some compromises where they need to in order to get a national standard that preempts all of these state standards um, that could create kind of this really – uh, difficult patchwork of rules to navigate for a big company. Boy, if you want to have a great conversation with someone on an interesting topic, talk to a journalist because they talk to every smart person in the sector. <laughs> Kim Hart, managing editor at Axios, former FCC press secretary, deeply involved in the SDV scene, especially in D.C. right now. What a pleasure, Kim. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. Sharif Marakbi is president and CEO of Ford Autonomous Vehicles, joins us here now. And Sharif, 
Thanks for taking time with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Let's begin with a bit of a level set, if you don't mind. Where are self-driving vehicles right now? And I think there's almost a a two-fold path, right? One is more commercial and one is more consumer-centric. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in general, there's there's a lot of hype uh, and and uh, reports around where everyone is with autonomous cars, and I always find it interesting when people say, "Oh, we have a lot of autonomous cars on the road today," and and in reality, is where where autonomous cars are is in development. So, uh, the industry, uh, the world is working on autonomy and integrating that with cars. Uh, riding and driving on roads with safety drivers uh, to develop the system so at some point in the future uh, you're not going to have someone sitting in the front seat. And we believe that's going to be around the 2021 time frame, so three more years, uh, to make sure that we work out all the, the kinks, if you will, mm-hmm. all the, the tech, the tech uh, things where you can ride the vehicle on public roads, with pedestrians, with cyclists, and be safe. Uh, and if things happen, it can react to those things in a mass scale uh, in 2021. So when you talk about the kinks that need to be worked out, uh, there seem to be two sets. One is much more of the engineering side, uh, hardware, software, um, the technology at work, which we'll, which we'll get to in a second. But there's also... Um, uh, a, a softer set of challenges, if you will, that is perception, right? Understanding um, the consumer or public embrace of the fact that there will be vehicles on our roads without anyone behind the wheel, maybe without a steering wheel to begin with, and that they'll be safer than what we have right now. That's right. That's right. So today, uh, you know, in the U.S., for example, there's over 30,000 deaths uh, in, on roads in the U.S., and uh, over 90% of them are human-caused. Uh, and when we implement all these um, sensing and, and, and systems in the car, it's to minimize uh, that, you know, those instances. And you can see the opportunity is tremendous to reduce and to improve safety, to imp- reduce accidents and improve safety tremendously with autonomous cars. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the reality. That's the goal of, of what we're trying to do uh, to get autonomous cars on the road. And our research uh, at CTA, and this is just about two years old right now, shows that the majority of consumers uh, would like to test drive or, or, or test ride. I think we need the right terminology uh, yeah. on, on this, but a self-driving vehicle. And the majority also would be willing to trade in their current car for a self-driving vehicle to give it a shot. Now, surveys that are trending negative, it it may have something to do with the way the questions are phrased or or how it's posed. But there is a perception that has to be overcome, right? Do you see that turning soon? Has it already happened? Or is it uh, a major step that is still to come? Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of, and and the the surveys are usually, uh, could have, like you mentioned, positive or negative results. What what we've observed and what we're working on is actually putting, uh, you know, in in today's world, driven vehicles, but they are uh, simulated autonomous behaviors to see how people behave, one, if you're riding in the car, two, even if you're outside the car, pedestrians, cyclists, Mm -hmm. how do they feel and and uh, feel good or not good about having an autonomous car riding on on roads. So some of the things we're we're doing is is to uh, build that trust through all the things that we're doing. Uh, simple things like when people can see on a screen in the car what they're seeing with their eyes through the windshield and they know that the car is seeing everything they're seeing and more and reacting to those, you start seeing that level of anxiety or concern really reduce mm-hmm. uh, there are people in the car. Uh, another thing, example we have is we, we've had uh, some work in, with Virginia Tech and, and on the road where we, we include certain signals that the, that the autonomous car would give to pedestrians and learning what people feel about certain signals 
if you think about we we as humans and drivers are very sophisticated and people look at the driver's eye contact and gestures to know where they're going and where they're going to take the vehicle. Mm -hmm. We we don't have any of that in an autonomous car. So we have to create those signals and and those gestures. So a lot of that is is key in our view to build that trust of an autonomous car, plus having um, all the engineering that we're doing and making sure that when we take a car on the road, we've done the testing in a, on a proving grounds. We've we've done all the the engineering, the simulation, and be able to put that. The more people get used to those cars being on the road, the more their level of concern is reduced. So let's follow that a little bit, Sharif. And and this is I think much more in your wheelhouse, which is the engineering side of things. Um, where are the challenges right now? Because already um, self-driving vehicles have achieved. You know, depending on your perspective, a remarkable level of autonomy and recognition. Um, what's next in that line from an engineering standpoint that needs to be done? And, and you already alluded to the various obstacles and behaviors that have to be considered. Yeah, I mean, the biggest, uh, the biggest area of work to make an autonomous car work is the software, meaning the percept, you know, when, when you're a human driving the car, your eyes and your ears do most of the work to alert you to what you need to do uh, to, as you're driving this car. Well, we don't have that human anymore. So the perception, and we call it the prediction, understanding where the car is as you're driving and then reacting to it, and then finally steering or braking or accelerating the car is all done through software. So the brain of the system is the software. So having that technology, perfect that technology to the point that you can rely on that uh, instead of a driver is the biggest challenge. And that's what's taken uh, a long time. But you're right that it's made tremendous progress in the last few years. And now we have to get it at scale. And uh, Ford as an auto company, that knows how to do scale, that knows how to do vehicles at tens of thousands of, of, of vehicles in different circumstances behave in a safe way is, is in a good position to do that. And we're actually applying some of these engineering rules to software to get that functional safety correct. So you mentioned rules. I think that's an interesting avenue to take. And we as drivers, as pedestrians, as cyclists, any mode of transportation are unpredictable. We as humans make mistakes. We don't pay attention. We don't obey the rules sometimes. How in the world do you write code or get software that can respond to these um, unpredictabilities that we do? Well, that's really a good point. So the interesting thing is um, we, we're designing, and I think you know most of the industry is designing uh, their, their, we'll call it self-driving system or software to obey the rules. Right, so we're actually right. designing everything to obey the speed limit, to obey the, you know, when you turn, to obey what you do. And I can guarantee you there's not going to be any self-driving car texting while driving. <laughs> so, so, so it's going to be better for sure uh, in terms from that perspective. Uh, the, 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 really, the, the challenge here becomes um, what we're learning as we're getting the self-driving cars to follow all these rules isn't, you know, like you said, uh, many of the humans driving on the road actually don't necessarily follow some of those uh, rules. And if only the self-driving car is doing that, it becomes uh, an odd situation. So one of the things we're working on, for example, is when it gets into situations that uh, the self-driving car is maybe uh, behaving very differently than a human, is how do we actually work with the city, work with the, you know, the legislators, work with uh, the, the rules of the road, I'll call it, to make sure it's more human, yet doesn't break the rules, which is really something that we're in the middle of right now. So you have been at Ford a long time, Sharif. Uh, you started there in 1990. Uh, more than a few things have changed about the auto industry since then. But um, in all seriousness, you are very familiar with breakthrough innovations. You've led the delivery of 
battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, hybrid electric vehicles, the whole EV sector. Are there parallels between that and what you're working on right now? Maybe not as profound a game changer as SDVs will be, but EVs, electric vehicles, were, were a breakthrough. That was innovation and disruption. Absolutely. I mean, one one uh, little fact is just since joining the auto industry uh, back in the 90s, I've, I've always had passion for uh, technology, but not for the sake of technology. Um, I'll call it commercializing technology, making sure that you can actually have technology for the masses, uh, for the benefits of, of society. When you look at battery electric vehicles or hybrids or plug-in hybrids, or uh, in addition, I worked on uh, driver assist technology. I worked on infotainment systems uh, throughout my career. And those are all, at the time that I was working on them, they, they were all brand new. They were new. They were unknown. You had to develop uh, requirements. What is the customer looking for? Uh, how do you create something that, that is a wow for the customer? And I really thrive and I've really enjoyed over many, many years and a couple of decades, uh, always looking at that technology and creating automobiles that can do things that people never thought they hmm. can do. Uh, and there's a lot of parallel uh, to what we're doing now. Um, autonomous cars today feel like what electric cars felt uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, they, they're just getting going uh, where you know nobody knows what they're supposed to do, how they should accelerate, what kind of features you can put on them, those types of things. Except for one thing. Autonomous cars are more than just the car. Um, when we talk about autonomous vehicles, it's the software integration into the car. That's the engineering piece and making sure it's done at scale with, with safety and everything. That's only the beginning. Um, autonomous cars, as we launch them, are going to be in service, which means somebody is going to be riding in it. If you think about it, the auto industry has been designing cars for over 100 years where they're focused on the most you know, critical passenger in the vehicle, which is the driver. A lot of cars have one person in them, which is a driver. So majority of things that are done around the automobile are to protect, to entertain, to provide service to that driver. Well, that person does not exist anymore in an autonomous car. So it really makes us think and it makes us need to think very differently. Uh, there may be, you know, most of these vehicles are going to have people sitting in the back. So what does that mean? What kind of uh, service do they want when, when they're riding the car, not driving in the car? Yeah, so that's, where, you, that's where I yeah, thought you were going originally, Sharif, when you said uh, these will be more than just a car. I thought you were heading toward the fact that these will be um, you know, office spaces, right, where you're working now on your on your commute to the office. Um, these are entertainment centers where you will have a, you know a, a panoply of options to to enjoy yourself while you're getting from point A to point B. These will be you know micro hotel rooms or maybe maybe an extension of your bedroom where you can sleep or rest when you're when you're traveling. And all that begs the question of of what will the car be if it's not just transportation? Right. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, you know, one, one of the things we think about autonomous cars is the interior has to be very different than how we do cars today. Right. Uh, right. To, your, to your point, uh, they need to be we, we call them and our vision calls them what we're going to free the person that's riding in the vehicle, that they can be the most productive. And that could be one of many things. It could it could mean. If you want to do work on the way to, to work, uh, it frees you up to do that. If you want to watch a movie, if you want to text, uh, if you want to sleep, uh, it, it's a lot of different things to different people. And what we're in the middle of is actually looking at that interior experience, uh, not only after you get into the interior, but when you're sitting through the ride, what kind of uh, thing do we need to be looking at and designing differently than what we do today in vehicles. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. So you mentioned uh, your company, Ford, in the context of, of uh, this sector and bringing ideas, concepts, innovations at scale. Um, 
What does the landscape look like from your point of view, Sharif, with the combination of uh, the big auto companies, primarily Detroit, uh, and then the software-driven tech-centric companies, often out of Silicon Valley, although it's, it's around the world. Um, what does that balance look like to you right now, and how, how critical is that? Yeah, and I've had the opportunity to work both in Detroit and automotive and also in the Silicon Valley, uh, you know, working on, uh, you know, looking at the integration of that software. So Mm -hmm. I've had the experience on on both sides. And I think from my perspective, the most important thing is that um, each side respects the fact that the other has to do work in a different manner. And what I mean by that is um, Detroit and automotive is really good at – uh, mass production of of hardware safety, making sure the systems work in in different scenarios as the car is riding uh, on the streets, and making sure that it that it works every time. What the Silicon Valley is really good at is agile software development and be able to do uh, updates very frequently and be able to you know to to provide that so that both of them can integrate that at scale into the vehicle. So what Ford has done is actually taken, uh, the, you know, the two pieces, and we're actually doing both in a different way to scale in 2021. Sharif, final question. Uh, you mentioned 2021 as a milestone year for the self-driving vehicle industry. Is there a year, is there a general time frame that you could envision uh, the majority of vehicles on our roadways being self-driving? I think that's going to be a long time for a few reasons. The, the initial set of autonomous vehicles are going to be very expensive because the, there's the sensors and, and everything that's going to go on. them. it's going to be very expensive for someone to own these vehicles. In addition, they do need uh, a lot of what we call high definition mapping because you can't it has to, you have to actually be uh, driving on the road, identifying all the objects and reacting to them. So there's geofencing, we call it, or a specific area where they can operate. So th- that's just the initial phase. The cost will come down over time, and the technology will get better to the point that you can keep expanding where these autonomous cars go in many areas. And then comes personal ownership, someone buying an autonomous car. We call those level five. So for all of these reasons and all the things that need to happen over time, I think it's going to be many, many years before you see you start seeing uh, a, a majority of vehicles on the road being autonomous. But it cannot be any more exciting, to be honest, that, to see that robotics and engineering and all of this technology coming together and making them human to the point that we're actually talking about a good portion of the cars being autonomous. Yeah, that is a true innovator's perspective right there. Sharif Marakbi is president and CEO of Ford Autonomous Vehicles. Sharif, fascinating conversation. I'm sorry we have to to put a bookmark in it right there. Um, Great to talk to you, and we will see you at CES 2019. Thank you very much, Tyler. All right, next time here on CES Tech Talk, we are looking at startups at CES. Did you know Eureka Park at CES 2019 will be the largest collection of startups on the entire planet? So we're getting a unique view. We are talking to a Fortune 500 company about startups at CES. They will give you a deep dive into the current trends that they're seeing in the startup world right now, how the place, the sector is evolving, and also how to stand out from the crowd if you're a startup at CES. All right, that is a wrap, everybody. We want you to be CES ready, so subscribe to this CES Tech Talk podcast. That way you won't miss any of our episodes as you're getting geared up for the show. Speaking of, CES 2019 is January 8th to 11th in Las Vegas. The information you need is at ces.tech, ces.tech. As always, none of this is possible without our stars in studio, our producer, Tina Anthony, our engineer, John Lindsay. You both rock. We will talk to you next time on this podcast. Until then, I'm Tyler Suters. Let's talk tech again soon.